Well, good morning and happy Sunday to you. Uh, what a great weekend we've had so far. Yesterday was the official start of spring, so that is so good news. Um, so hopefully we can keep a hold of this warm weather. Again, I got my flip-flops on today, but you can't see it. But just trust me, my feet are feeling great, uh, not in a pair of shoes because it's cold outside. So uh, I have a couple announcements this morning. Uh, one is that on March 27th from 1 to 3 p.m., we're going to be holding a food drive at the church. It's kind of going to be a drive-through food drive where you can uh, just kind of drive up underneath the uh, overhang uh, behind the church and you can drop off your canned goods or other items that will actually all go to Fish Food Pantry. So this is kind of our Easter outreach uh, this year as we help support uh, our local food pantry that is continuing to help people within the Fairborn area. And we are being for Fairborn uh, by doing this. And fish is in desperate need of cereals and protein items. So, I mean, you can add other things in there too, but uh, those are the two things that they really are in need of right now. So um, if you want to participate with this and just bring some food by, uh, we would love to have you do that. If you want to volunteer and be part of the drop-off, you are more than welcome to do that. We can always use volunteers and you can reach Cindy at fairbornumc at gmail.com if you're interested in volunteering. Uh, but again, if you can't volunteer, that's okay. Uh, but if you could uh, donate some food so we can help fish so that they can continue to help uh, our community. So my second announcement is actually an introduction uh, for the individual who's giving our sermon today. I was in conversation this past week uh, with a friend of mine and we were just talking about life and all good, good things. And she said, hey, would it be okay if I guest preached for you? Uh, and I said, absolutely. Uh, so this is going to be preaching is Wendy Leibarger. She is actually the assistant uh, district superintendent for our Miami Valley district, but she's also uh, been a friend of mine for eons or what seems like. Uh, we were in local uh, pastors licensing school together. Um, I think we may have been in seminary. Uh, that was way long time ago. Um, but Wendy and I kind of go way back and she is, a beautiful human being and I know that you will be blessed with every word that's going to come out of her mouth. Um, she has led churches. Uh, she uh, has done all kinds of things within uh, a ministry scope and I know that uh, she has got an amazing heart for Jesus. So I am excited for you to hear her this morning and get a break from listening to me. Uh, she's going to be preaching on Lazarus and what a great story to hear as we enter into uh, the last kind of weeks of Lent and get closer to Palm Sunday and Easter, this idea that, um, you know, Jesus can raise us up out of the ashes, even a dead man. You know, even when life is got us way deep down in that pit, you know, even then God can raise us up and Jesus can raise us up out of the ashes of utter defeat uh, into that new life and resurrection that we so desperately need in life. So I am excited to have you here, Wendy. It is an incredible message, and I look forward to being back with you next Sunday for Palm Sunday. What a great Sunday to come back to, and um, we will celebrate the soon-to-be Easter Sunday morning. So if you are ready, I know Wendy is uh, more than ready, and make sure you got your coffee, your uh, morning snacks, and a comfy seat because it's going to be a great Sunday morning. If you're ready, all right, here we go. Good morning, Fairborn UMC. I'm Reverend Wendy Leibarger, currently serving as the assistant to the superintendent here in the Miami Valley District. I bring you greetings from Bishop Gregory Von Palmer, resident bishop of the West Ohio Annual Conference, and Reverend Dr. Jocelyn Roper, superintendent of the Miami Valley District. I also want to give a shout out and a special thank you to my colleague and seminary buddy, Pastor Megan, for the invitation to be with you this fifth Sunday of Lent. 
When I hear the words ashes to ashes, I think of that day that I get to walk around with dirt on my face, Ash Wednesday, the day we begin the season of Lent. But then my mind quickly goes to the words I've heard in numerous gravesides. This body we commit to its final resting place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Today, we are going to head to a graveside with Jesus and the disciples, with the siblings who many think were dear friends of Jesus. As we pray, our hearts prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word. Would you pray with me? O oh God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Give to us now your grace, that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die, and when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live so that living or dying, our life may be in you, and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. If you recognize that prayer, it is from our book of worship. It's part of the service of death and resurrection, and I don't know how many times I've prayed it. Well, I could if I look back through my records. But there's one phrase that I've prayed much more, one couplet that's captured my heart and frequents my thoughts. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die, and when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live. We are a resurrection people. We follow a risen Savior. We sing, this is the day of new beginnings, and great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. We say we believe in the grace of God, whereby we can begin again. A chance to move on, a fresh start, a chance to rise from the ashes is what so many of us truly desire. But it's also one of the most difficult things to do. Moving on means acknowledging that what came before is gone and something has died. We are steadily making our way through Lent to get to Easter Sunday. And let's face it, who would willingly choose giving up if it weren't for the candy awaiting us from the Easter Bunny? But before Easter Sunday comes Good Friday. And spoiler alert, as Megan would say, Jesus is arrested, tried, crucified, dies, and is buried. The stone is rolled over the entrance to the tomb. He is dead. We hear these words all the time. They seem harsh and cold to us. Some of us want to avoid the finality of the words, and we have all kinds of euphemisms so that we can avoid saying that someone is dead. Sometimes we can't hear the direct truth. But often, these are very pastoral words. It is dead. We need to hear that directly sometimes. A loved one has died. The job is over. You have an addiction. This is out of your control. That is unacceptable behavior. To hear the truth directly, even the most painful and devastating truth, is a first step in moving on, in resurrection and in salvation itself. We all yearn for a clean slate, a forgotten past, a forgiven record, a fresh start, but a second chance doesn't come without fear. And new life cannot begin when we're in denial. Along with the opportunity to begin again is the fear of starting over. For a second chance is too sacred to risk. It's the fear of a blank canvas when there are many chances for a mistake 
that will jeopardize this rare and new opportunity. Standing in front of a blank canvas, the artist's goal is to create something meaningful that yields beauty, not simply a picture to put on a wall to hide the hole behind it. But confronted with such an important task, we're afraid to fail. We may ease, feel it's easier to simply patch the hole in the wall. Our old mistakes are enough to shoulder without the possibility of flopping at a fresh start. Looking at a blank canvas can be paralyzing. The artist must decide where to start without knowing exactly how the final painting will look. And perhaps that's why more children use crayons than adults. They have no fear of failure, only a willing innocence. For those of us over the age of eight though, a blank canvas can be pretty terrifying. We need what the budding artist has. We need a willing innocence fostered by hope. We need to know that a blank canvas can become a masterpiece, a meaningful painting that is cherished and hung on the wall. It's hope that drives the budding artist as she creates something new. Hope that coaxes the phoenix from the ashes. And hope that drives Thomas as he follows Mary and Martha as they run out to meet Jesus and Lazarus as he steps from the ashes. We're going to spend our time in the story today that's found in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. I begin with verse 1. A certain man, Lazarus, was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the Mary who anointed the Lord with her fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. And when he heard this, Jesus said, This illness isn't fatal. It's for the glory of God, so that God's Son can be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus, and when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was. After two days, he said to the disciples, let's return to Judea again. The disciples replied, Rabbi, the Jewish opposition wants to stone you, but you want to go back? Jesus answered, aren't there 12 hours in the day? Whoever walks in the day doesn't stumble because they see the light of the world. But whoever walks in the night does stumble because the light isn't in them. Jesus continued, our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I'm going in order to wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll get well. They thought Jesus meant that Lazarus was in a deep sleep. But Jesus had spoken about Lazarus' death. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. For your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you can believe. Let's go to him. Then Thomas, the one called Didymus, said to the other disciples, let us go too, so that we may die with Jesus. We're here with the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Mary's the one who sits at Jesus' feet and listens, who anoints his feet with oil and wipes them with her hair. Martha, she's the one in the kitchen, the one busy preparing food and cleaning up, fixing things. She's the one who loves to serve. And Lazarus, he's their brother, the one whom Jesus loved, the one who's ill. We know them. The people who are devoted to study and prayer. Those who like to serve. And people who are sick or hurting from one thing or another. They're part of our families, part of our church. They are us. So why doesn't Jesus drop everything he's doing and rush over to see Lazarus? Doesn't Jesus realize I'm going down in flames? If God really loved me... I'd get an immediate response. 
Those are the questions we ask of God, the questions we ask of each other. Yet Jesus didn't need to respond according to urgent requests and heightened anxiety. The strength, health, and wholeness that Jesus brings is beyond our notion of time. Yet Jesus will walk straight back through the area where once they tried to stone him, Jesus will return. And Thomas, I love Thomas, he's the one who's called the twin, often called Doubting Thomas. Many commentators on this passage remark that Thomas's comment is fatalistic, or at best a typical disciple move, one that really doesn't understand what he's saying. I disagree. This is Thomas who is not hiding behind closed doors when Jesus first appeared to the disciples on Easter evening. This is Thomas who was the first to declare the risen Jesus as my Lord and my God. This is Thomas who is willing to walk into the conflict, ready to follow where his teacher leads him, committed to go where he might die. Let's pick up this story at verse 17. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was a little less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to comfort Martha and Mary after their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, while Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus told her, your brother will live again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, God's son, the one who is coming into the world. When Jesus gets there, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And who can blame Martha for saying, why didn't you come? But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And I don't know about you, but I've often heard that scripture. And when I do, it's a focus on Jesus saying, I am the resurrection. But Jesus also says, I am the life. Of course, what's on Martha's mind is the resurrection on the last day. And like Martha, we tend to focus on that final resurrection that we situate for ourselves as a distant promise, the guarantee of future salvation, our eternal life with God and Jesus in heaven. But Jesus seems to correct her. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus turns upside down the established view of end times. In Christ, we are raised to life, not as future salvific experience, but to life right now, right here with Jesus. And for Lazarus, this story is not about his future with Jesus, but his present. Believing is not about waiting to be taken away. The gift of abundant life is clearly a present as well as a future reality. A few years ago, a colleague organized an Easter parade at the church she was serving. She invited men and women and youth and families to participate. Now, this wasn't about showing off their new Easter outfits, she explained. It was about telling their resurrection stories, as each created a two-sided sign. On one side was their version of death, and on the other side, their version of new life. Some of them read, 19 years enslaved by alcohol, 12 years and counting, dry and freed by Jesus. 
lived a selfish life doing my own thing, following God's call and doing God's thing. Disabled from a job I loved, freed for time to serve, felt alone and abandoned, found security, peace, and comfort. Being bullied and mad at God, giving pain to God and allowing the embrace of my church family. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. But in order for there to be resurrection, we must let the old way die. Commit it to its final resting place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Let's pick up the story at verse 38. Jesus was deeply disturbed again when he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone covered its entrance. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, the smell will be awful. He's been dead for four days. Jesus replied, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see God's glory? So they removed the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Martha wants her brother. She wants life for him. She has chastised Jesus. Surely if you had been here, he would not have died. She's pleaded, I know whatever you ask of God, he will give you. And then they go to the tomb, the place of death. And Martha's tomb seems to change. She has named Jesus the Messiah. But does she trust the new life he brings? Take away the stone. By this time, after four days, there will be an order. Or as the King James Version said, Lord, it stinketh. The Bible doesn't mince words when it comes to accurate descriptions sometimes. But there's meaning in this verse. Lord, it stinks. Sometimes in order to have a resurrection, matters are foul and messy. Resurrections do not happen when all is sterile and clean and smelling like our favorite room de deodorizer. Where things stink is exactly where resurrections can occur. Where things stink is exactly where resurrections can occur. So they roll away the stone. And we hear the great words of good news. They are words which could be on the lips of every one of us today. Jesus assumes the traditional prayer posture of the time, raised hands, looking upward, and having prayed aloud the words of new life, come Lazarus, come out. Wherever we want resurrection, we should be able to proclaim, come out live again. Lazarus hears the summons of the dear friend whom he has entertained in his home. He hears the call of the rabbi under whose teaching he has sat. He hears the coaxing of the Messiah who offers new life from the ashes of death. But Lazarus, Lazarus must choose to come out of the tomb. And like Lazarus, we must come out of the tomb when we're called. And there's one more verse to the story. Verse 44. The dead man came out, his feet bound and his hands tied and his face covered with a cloth. Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. Looking around at the crowd, at the community in which Lazarus had lived, at the community in which Lazarus will live, Jesus says, unbind him, let him go. 
These words are almost better than Lazarus come out. Indeed, they may be even more powerful because now the community needs to assist in the resurrection. Unbind him, let him go. There are people yearning to live resurrected lives. There are folks who have been born again. They've been raised from the dead, but they are still tangled up in their burial clothes. They still have the grave clothes of death and ashes all over them. They're still bound up in loss and longing and old arguments. They're smothered in the ashes of old situations and old relationships. You know what that's like. You know when you're trying to move on to a new life, but you seem to somehow be constrained in the trappings of the old one. This is where we need community, friends. This is where we need help. This is where we need others. This is where we need to be the body of Christ because it is the task of the body of Christ to complete the action of resurrection. Jesus called forth new life, but Lazarus still has those burial clothes on. And so Jesus tasks the community, unbind him and let him go. Those should be the words that are our orders every day. Unbind somebody. Where you find someone in the bonds of grief, your friends, your neighbor, your spouse, even the stranger, when you find someone struggling to be free, unbind them, let them go. Do not keep them tangled up in the old affairs of dysfunction and pain and hunger. Those clothes constrict. The ashes can make us ill. When we refuse to let someone or something go, when we refuse to forgive, when we refuse to see new life, it is we who are keeping them dead. The community has that much power. Don't hold on to the past. Don't hold on to the sin. Don't hold on to death. If we are the body of Christ, we can let someone go today. Brush off the ash. Release them. Set them free. Hope is born when we are willing to let the things die that must. The only way that leads to resurrection is the way that leads through letting go. The way that walks through the ashes. Where things stink is exactly where resurrections can also occur. Jesus' power is not merely the power to raise from the dead, as if that weren't enough. It's the power to give new life, whole life. Living with life with Jesus comes as qualitatively different from being alive in body only. We do not know what resurrection will mean for us in the end, we cannot know how it will feel or work or look, but we do have evidence that it is so. God has woven resurrection into our daily lives so that we can learn the shape of it and perhaps learn to trust the strength of it when it comes our own time. We need second chances, new beginnings, and fresh starts, and we need hope. For without hope, we will just stand there looking at the perfectly good blank canvas. And we need to simply start painting, holding back any fear, for the second step is only discovered after taking the first. We may not know what the final painting will look like when we begin. In fact, not knowing what the painting will look like, well, that could be the whole point so that we're always leaning toward the help of God and the help of others as we begin again, as we rise from the ashes. Life is not a paint by numbers project, but if the world is going to believe, the world needs to see the body of Christ living the resurrection life of Jesus, rolling away stones, unbinding grave claws of death, rising from the ashes to live the Easter life that begins.
Let us pray. O God, who calls us from death to life, with people of all times and all places, roll away the stones of worry and of stress, of self-doubt and fear, of judgment and rejection, of hatred and bitterness. Free us from the bonds of selfishness, of anger, frustration, suffering, pain. Call us from the ashes to new life, that we may go forth and fully live the life of love that you created us for, and call us to live each day.